quantum computer. All right. So today is going to be an interesting lesson where we are on the same, we're on the page of talking about patterns, right? Type going from chapter 6.1 and 6.2. Um, and in chapter 6.2 specifically, we learned about how we can express patterns as a recursive formula using the previous term plus something or whatever it might be um, to define the next term, right? So if I'm looking for T2, I can use T1 and do something to it. If I want T3, I use T2 and do something to it, so on and so forth. Today's pattern called, um, we are gonna be looking at something called Pascal's triangle, which uses the idea of recursive formula and um, a very interesting sort of sequence occurs and we can apply lots of funny sort of puzzle-like patterns from it. We can take it from it. Uh, but of, of, of course, as well, we can take a very interesting application to mathematics, uh, particularly at the grade 11 level, uh, something called binomial expansion. I probably butchered that introduction, but uh, I am going to try to make it as exciting as possible. Any questions from chapter 6.1 or 2 that we can take up before we begin? So the floor is yours. If there's anything that you want to ask, like homework, for example. No? I'm hoping that you got a chance to do the homework, that it's not empty. All right, everyone, please make sure you get a chance to do it. I'm assuming then that the, M, the silence is because you understand the material perfectly. Okay, today we're going to go into something called Pascal's Triangle, and that is written both here and in the handout that you see in our uh, Google Drive, uh, Google Classroom already. Okay, so without um, going through all of this and without reading anything, I'd like to ask you, do you see what this pattern is? Have you seen this before? If you have, you know, feel free to mention, what do you see as a pattern in this triangle, this pyramid? Okay, I'm going to draw the next one. And one more. I see something in chat. Let me finish. 84, 26, 26, and then a mirror image, 36, 9, and 1. Someone in chat says, page 270, number 80. Oh, this is for homework. Sure. While everyone is sort of guessing, let me take a look at what that question is in the textbook. Give me a sec. 370. And to start today, we do have a request. Number 8B from page 370 is, uh, write the first four terms of the sequence. It says f of 1 is equal to 8. So you can say that term 1 is equal to 8. And f of n is going to be f of n minus 1 over 2. So in a sense, what you can say is if n equals a 2, that means f of 2 minus 1 over 2. So you're going to take the previous number, so f of 1, which is up there. You're going to take f of 1 and divide by 2. f of 2 is equal to 4. Next, f of 3 means the n value is a 3. Okay. So f of 3 means I take the previous term, f of 2, 
and divide by 2, which means that is 4 divided by 2, that's a 2. And the pattern continues. Lastly, f of 4 would be f of 3 divided by 2. And what is f of 3? It's a 2. There it is. Okay. So again, it's just a practice of um, using the previous terms to calculate the next terms. Hope that helps. Any other questions? No? All right. Let's get started. Did anyone get a chance to take a look at the Pascal's triangle and see what the pattern is? Going once, going twice. No? Okay. Um, you may have seen something like this before. I'm not quite sure. Pascal's triangle is simply a extended version of, um, what do you call it? An extended version of recursive formula. Please take a look. Pascal's triangle is simple. Whatever number we're looking at, let's say 15, 15 is actually a sum of the two numbers directly above it. So 15 is 5 plus 10. And that applies to everything else. So 3 plus a 3 is a 6. 4 plus a 6 is a 10. And the 5 plus a 10 is a 15. The 6 plus the 15 is a 26. Basically, every single number is just a sum of the two numbers directly above it. Diagonally, of course, because there's no number directly, directly above. But I think you get the point. 56 is 35 plus 21. So without memorizing, as long as you know that the first row start at 1 and then 1, 1, you can do it, right? Like 1 drops down to 1 and 1. This also drops down to 1 and 1. But the left and right arrows here, 1 plus 1 equals 2. 1, 1 plus 2, 2 plus 1, and 1, so on and so forth. I'd like you to um, take an opportunity to not just copy this down per se, but actually fill in your sheet uh, by adding things together. You should be able to simply add that together without having to copy what I wrote, right? So 2 plus 1 would be 3. Let me zoom in on this so that we can look at it better. All right, clear this again. Um, so yeah, 2 plus 1 equals 3. And then 1 plus 3 equals 4. 3 plus 3 equals 6. 3 plus 1 equals 4. And you see there's a mirror image, that's fine. And then that would be a 5. 4 plus 6 is a 10. And then a 10. And then a 5. And a 1. Would you please finish this pattern? And from here, I have some interesting things I want to show you once we have that down. So, 21, 35, 35, 21, 7, 8, I need everyone to sort of not be writing and, and paying attention when I start next. So once you are done, you can sort of give me a, a thumbs up or something. And I'll take a look at if everyone's ready. We've got two people, three, or else. Try to fill it in as best you can. I do need everyone to sort of, um, yeah. It's not a big deal. I mean, I'm going to spend the first, next like five, 10 minutes just talking about how amazing Pascal's triangle actually is. Um, and look at all the different patterns you can pull out from it and how coincidentally there are there's like websites like websites on websites trying to pull out as many different patterns from pascal's triangle as possible and really the sky's the limit i'm going to show you some of the more common ones and then we'll, we'll go from there okay so 
I hope everyone got a chance to take a look at that. Here it is. Just because I'm going to start color coding all this, um, I am going to go to the whiteboard, but I want to mention a couple of things. To organize ourselves, I'm going to refer some of these terms uh, based on their location in Pascal's triangle. And to do that, I need to introduce two different numbers. The first number represents which row they are, and it uses the letter N. So I'm going to clean this up in a second, just bear with me. The second number is going to talk about which diagonal they are, and I'm going to use the letter R. Okay, so to be very specific here, once you have Pascal's triangle, note that the first row, this one, actually doesn't really count as a proper row. We say that this is a zeroth row, zero row, okay? It, it doesn't really count. But starting from the one, one row, we finally give it a number. This is two. This is three. This is row number four. This is row number five. This is row number six, row number seven, and row number eight. I'm guessing some people will copy this down. Following, as I said, we need to give a number to represent the diagonal. It's sort of like an XY, right? So this is, again, all just ones. There's nothing special about it. We call this the zeroth row, okay, the row number zero. This is the first row. This would be the second row. And this is the third row. That is the fourth row. And that is the fifth row, so on and so forth. Sorry, what am I saying row? Diagonal, the first diagonal, the second diagonal, the third diagonal, fourth diagonal, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth diagonal. And the diagonal, of course, goes as far as we write it. Okay. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to show you some interesting combinations just so that you believe me in saying there's a there's a reason why we in grade 11 uh, take actually take some time to study this funky thing called Pascal's triangle. Here is, uh, let's see, I need to go back to my whiteboard. Here is one such pattern. So we talked about what Pascal's triangle is. Here's another pattern I would like you to consider. All right. The first row is just, just one, right? There's nothing special about it. The second row is just regular numbers, right? R being one is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's fine. Um, and each of these rows actually have something very interesting, um, an interesting application in the world. I don't quite remember what all of these rows actually do, but I do remember the third one. So row number two. Row number two, we call it um, pyramidal numbers. Okay, that's one of the patterns. And what do I mean by that? Um, these are the numbers that I would, uh, these are the numbers involved if I were to stack items so that they stand on top of each other, for example. Let's pretend I have a ball, okay? So I have a ball. If I have the ball sit on the floor, that's just, that's just what it is. But if I were to have this ball nestled along other balls, I would need three more balls to nestle it. I'm probably butchering it here, so just bear with me. That's one. Let's pretend I have this ball nestled inside the divot of three other balls, right? If I wanted to create like a pyramid, how many balls would I need to have this one ball stable on top of it? Well, I would need three underneath. So it's like one ball and then one, two, and then three to create a triangle-based pyramid, okay? I hope you're following me. This is like a bird's eye view. So this is one, that would be two, and that would be three. Now, what if I wanted a third layer underneath the blue balls? Well, let's take the red. The blue ball on the top would have to be nestled in 
three balls underneath, the bottom left blue ball would have to have three balls underneath, and the bottom left blue ball would have to have three balls underneath. So the first row was just one ball, the second row had three balls, and the third row has six balls, right? So it becomes one, three, and then six. And then the next row, if I were to go that far, we would need three balls to nestle the top red one, three balls to nestle the second red, three balls to nestle the third red, three balls to nestle the bottom left, the middle, and the bottom right. So if you add up all the pinks, and there's a pink right behind the black ball, you would have 10 balls added on to the next layer. So that would be here. I, I'm hoping you, you get the point. Okay, You don't have to be excited about it as I, I do, but it is what it is. Oh, in doing so, I actually remembered what the next line is. The next line is actually the sum of all the numbers in, uh, used in the pyramidal numbers. So if you take a look, think about it, if I were to talk about the first row, that's just one. But when you add the three balls in the second row, one plus three is four. If you add the red balls, that's the six balls, one plus three plus six, that's a 10. And that's a 20, so on and so forth. So this would be like the sum of the pyramid of numbers that are used. Okay, I'm just trying to get you to see that there's a lot of interesting pattern. Here's another fun pattern. I'm going to use green. Um, if I draw a hockey stick starting from starting from any of the ones, the tail end of the hockey stick where you actually touch the puck will be the sum of all the numbers in the stem. So for example, 1, 4, 10, and 20. If this is the stem of the hockey stick and this is the sort of like the head of it, the 35 that's found in the head is equal to the sum of 1, 4, 10, and 20. So 1 plus 4 plus 10 plus 20 is 35. Let's draw another hockey stick. How about the other way? 1, 6, 24, 56. And if I draw the hockey stick with the head piece bent the other way, 84 is 1 plus 6 plus 21 plus 56. So I could draw the longest hockey stick ever, and it would still follow suit. I could do this row, and then the hockey stick, right? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, 5, 6, 7 equals 28. Some interesting patterns, right? One more thing before we move on, because I don't want to waste more, any more of your time than I already have. Please consider the sum of the rows, oops, sum of each row. What is the sum of this row? 2. What is the sum of this row? 4. What is the sum of this row? 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1. That's an 8. The sum of the next row? 1 plus 4, 5. Plus 6, 11. Plus 4, 15. Plus 1, 16. Without having to add the next row, what would you guess the next number to be? 32. 32, yeah, that's right. All of these are um, all values of the exponent with the base 2. 2 to the power of n. What is n? The n corresponds to the row number. 2 to the power of 1 is a 2. 2 to the power of row 2, that's a 4. 2 to the power of row 3, that's an 8. 2 to the power of row 4, that's a 16. Is that coincidence? In a sense, it is. And that's why Pascal's triangle is so weird. Such an interesting concept, or I don't even say concept, just an interesting pattern. Okay. Are there any questions of how you got to each of these numbers? Right. If you want an extra, another sort of uh, explanation of where this is coming from, you can think about it as like champagne towers. Like, I don't know what kind of parties you've been to or what kind of, you know, functions your parents might have taken you to. But, uh, you know, glitz and glamoury, 
maybe you've been to a a uh, a venue where they had this big cha champagne glass tower okay i'm going to use this as a example if you start pouring liquid into the first one and it starts to fill up once it begins to overflow this cup will pour into whatever cup is directly underneath so take a look at this row a question for you people listening to me which of these two cups fill up faster what do you think wouldn't they both be the same it would be the same so this left cup and the right cup would fill at the same rate and then one, as soon as these two fill up at the same rate and they begin to overflow, what's next? Once this overflows, the cups directly underneath it fill up at exactly the same rate. Same with this one. The difference about this next row, though, the leftmost cup only has one source of, um, of liquid, right? The rightmost cup also has one source of liquid, but the middle cup has two different sources filling it, which means the sec the middle cup will fill up twice as fast as the outer cups. And once we get to the next level, it gets even more interesting. Take a look at how many sources these three, uh, four cups have. The outermost one only has a source from here, it's just a one. This outermost has a source of one. The middle two cups are fed off of the one cup on the left and the middle cup on the right, but that middle cup is feeding off of two different sources. So this is one and three. The middle cup will fill up, so the middle two cups will fill up three times as fast as the ones on the outside. Okay? So it's that sort of general idea. And when you take that and you apply it to Pascal's triangle, some interesting probability ideas can also pull up as well. So I'm going to share screen and go back to our document. I'm hoping you had a chance to fill this in. I want you to have the 1331, all that stuff ready, because I'm going to refer to it and ask you some questions. All right. Let's take a look. Specifically, um, I'm going to ask you to consider the very last one. The very last one being uh, 1721, 35, 35, 21, and 7. Okay. If you've ever seen The Price is Right or any kind of game like this at a carnival, you will see that. Uh, Plinko is actually a pretty interesting, relatively decent um, probability game. Um, of course, it's difficult to win the grand prize, the grand prize of, in this case, $10,000. But it's still fun nonetheless. And you'll see where the probability comes from. So let's read this little blurb. A set of prizes are listed at the bottom on Plinko. A ball is dropped from the top of the board. Wherever the ball drops is the prize you can win. The catch, at each row there are pegs that will change the direction of the ball. In other words, it's a game of probability. Let's investigate that. So if I drop the ball here and it hits the peg, the ball has a choice of going left or going right. So it's a 50-50 chance. But from here, the ball now has a chance of going left or right. If the ball happened to fall to the right side peg, it has a chance of going right or left. So if you think about it that way, how many different ways can I get to the two? Two different ways. Does that sort of make sense? If I want to get to the one, the only way I can get to this point is by going left and then left. The only way I could get to the rightmost one is going right and then right. But the two here, the reason why I have two different possibilities is I can go left and then right, 
or I can go right and then left. There's two different ways I can get there. What are the total different ways I can get there? Four. Out of them, there is a one in four chance I get to the left side. There is a two in four chance I get to the middle. And I have a one in four chance I could get to the right. It's a game of probability. Let's go to the next one. If the next line is one, three, three, one, it means that I can get, there's only one way I can get to the one, which is, uh, let's see, let's use a highlighter. There's only one way I can get to the one here, and that is left, left, and then left. Left, left, then left. There is only one way I can get to the other one here, and that is right, right, then right. Right, right, then right. But the threes in the middle, let's see if we can hammer out what the three pathways are. I'm going to use green. I can go left, left, and right. So left, left, and right. I can go left, right, then left. Left, right, then left. Or I can go right, left, and left. I can go right, left, and left. So there's three different ways I can get to this circle. And I think, I think I've made my point. The last one. Uh, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, right. There are three different ways I can get there. So in terms of probability, there's a 1 in 8 chance, a 3 in 8 chance, a 3 in 8 chance, and a 1 in 8 chance to get to any of these balls. So the probability of getting into one of these areas becomes more and more spaced out until we get to the very last section where, wow, What's the probability? So now that you have this as part of your repertoire, I'd like you to answer this question on the bottom. It says, what is the probability of getting the grand, the grand prize, which is the 70? Probability by definition, so the probability of the desired outcome is going to be the number of ways to get the desired outcome over the total possible outcomes. So if I remember, this is in the 28, oh, sorry, 21, 35, 35, 21, 7, and 1. How many total outcomes are there for the seventh row? Anyone? Some of you might be adding all this. Others might have used the trick or the pattern that we talked about just like 10 minutes ago. Mr. Kim, mm -hmm. my, my numbers aren't like that. I don't know if that's just me, but I have different numbers from my last row. Oh, shoot. No, no, you're right. You're right. I'm, I think I'm wrong. It's not the seven. I have eight twenty. Okay, yeah, it's the eighth row. Sorry, it's the eighth row. You're right. Eight, that's 28. And then 30, 55 plus 21, that's a 56? No. Yeah. 20, okay, 56. Sorry yeah, 56. about that. I was looking at something else. 28 and 8. And, okay, so this is the eighth row. Eighth row. Sorry. Yeah, Alex has got it. That's for the second last row. So how many total outcomes are there? You can add all this, or you might remember, oh, this is the eighth row. The total outcomes would be 2 to the power of 8. Either way, you should have gotten a number of 256. How many different ways can we get the desired outcome? 70. 70 divided by a total of 256 ways gives you approximately... Two, seven, three, something. Three, four. 
So that means there is a 27.34% chance of the grand prize. That's not bad. It's over a quarter percent. But of course, if you look at all the other possibilities, their prizes are pretty dismal. It's like 100 bucks, 500, 1000, nothing compared to the $10,000 prize, right? So, I mean, it is what it is. I'll take whatever, right? Oh wait, and then there's all of course there's zero. If you take a look, there's even a higher percent chance of getting 56 and 56 out of 256. There's a higher chance of getting zero dollars. So that's where the trick and all those carnival games come from. Uh, case in point, in terms of carnival games, if you decide to take data management next year, there is an entire section on probability, and this is one of the big units of uh, like Pascal's triangle is one of the big units, and you learn a little bit more of how to find these numbers. It's pretty fun stuff. Okay. All right. So now that I have uh, effectively f in your ears with by gushing about how amazing Pascal's triangle is, um, I want to give you a formula just to wrap it up, and then we'll take a look at how this formula can, or how this Pascal's triangle can also be applied in the grade eleven level. Please take a look at this notation. Do you remember n? And do you remember how I've specified r before? The term numbers in Pascal's triangle, because there are so many numbers, each number is referred to as the row and diagonal number. So if I say term 3, 2, that means I'm looking at row number 3. So it's 1, 2, 3. And term two, uh, row, diagonal number two is zero, one, two. T term three comma two has a value of three. Let's try a different one. Let's say I'm looking for six here. Well, what row is six? What row is the six in? That's one, two, three. This is in the fourth row. And six is uh, diagonal zero, diagonal one diagonal 2. 4, 2 is equal to 6. Let's try, there's a 56 here. Let's try that. What row is this one? Term, that would be row number 8. What diagonal is this? 0, 1, 2, 3. Term 8, comma 3 is 56. You need to understand how to refer to these numbers if you are to understand the equation for Pascal's triangle. Bring it all the way down here. Okay. Pascal's triangle is defined as if I want to know what the row and diagonal, so what the term is depending on the row and the diagonal. We can find it by adding the two numbers directly above it. Okay. So if I am looking for, in this case, 8, 3, 8, comma, 3. 8, comma, 3 is the sum of term, two terms in the seventh row. It would be 2 and 3, the second diagonal and the third diagonal. Do you see, I hope you see where the equation is coming from. If I'm looking for a number in the eighth row, so n, then I need to add two numbers in the seventh row above it, so n minus 1, n minus 1. And then, if the diagonal happens to be the third diagonal, let me use a different color, third diagonal, that means the numbers that I added above also came from the third diagonal and the previous, the second diagonal. So if the diagonal is R, then it will be the previous, the same R and one R underneath. So this is the general equation for Pascal's triangle. And with that, we've successfully wrapped up looking at by, uh, the Pascal's triangle in different direction, different angles. Any questions about Pascal's triangle and how to, um, I guess, read this formula?
the most important part is, is to be able to read this formula. No questions? Okay. So um, the best I would do if I were to ask questions on Pascal's triangle is to, you know, try to try to get creative with this formula. Okay. But I'm actually not interested in a, the unique pattern by itself. I'm actually interested in how we can use these numbers, the one, two, one, the one, three, three, one, the one, four, six, four, one to our benefit when we are when we are dealing with binomials so the final pattern i'm going to leave with you is what i get most excited about at least in the grade 11 level please take a look pascal's triangle if we know how to use it will help us instantly expand any binomial so two term binomial with a exponent to it Okay, so everyone ready? I am going to start doing some FOIL, some distributive property, and multiplying this out. And what I'd like you to do is take my answer and see if you notice a similarity or some kind of corresponding coincidence with Pascal's triangle. Okay, so bear with me. The next five minutes are probably going to be silent. We have x plus y times x plus y, which is x times x, x times y, y times x, y times y. So I could equals 1 x squared, 2 xy, 1 y squared. Hmm. Is there a coincidence between this uh, exponent and the values you see here, hmm, maybe, maybe not. Let's continue. I'm going to use blue this time. Consider that value. This is equal to x plus y times x plus y times x plus y. And we already know what this is because we just multiplied it up there. So this is the same as x squared 2xy plus y, oh, y squared, sorry, multiplied by x plus y. So here goes. This is equal to x squared times x, x cubed, x squared times y, 2xy times x, 2xy times y, y squared times x, and y squared times y. And if I were to simplify this, we have 1 x cubed. Uh, they're the same, so group-like terms 3 x squared y. Group-like terms 3 x y squared. And then 1 y to the power of 3. Hmm. Is there a relationship with the exponent of 3 with the numbers that I highlight here. Who sees it? I see it. <laughs> you Would you like to enlighten us? Me, sir? Yes, go ahead. Well, um, you said earlier that like the first row or the second row mm -hmm. was a total. Four, which is two to the power of two mm -hmm. and that the third row was eight a total of eight which is two to the power of three mm -hmm. so when you look here when you do x plus y to the power of two it equaled the same numbers one two one as the row that was two squared mm -hmm. and when it was x plus y cubed it equaled the same numbers that was uh, two to the power of three, which was mm -hmm. one. Consider it. So this row is row one, right? So that is x plus y to the power of one, which is the same as just x and y. The coefficient is a one, 
and the coefficient is a 1. But from 2, it gets interesting. When n equals 2, the Pascal's triangle shows 1, 2, and 1, which matches the coefficients here. If the exponent says a 3 for a binomial, it's 1, 3, 3, 1, and it matches this. It matches the Pascal's triangle for that. So with that, then, we can actually use Pascal's triangle to quickly and easily uh, multiply this here. Now, there's a little bit more to it than just the numbers because, of course, there's the x values, right, and the y values. But um, without me telling you, what would you predict my terms to be? You don't have to worry about the x and y right now. What would you expect the first term to have? Someone else? Come on now. What would be the coefficients of my terms if I were to fully expand the last question? One, four, six, four, one. It would be one times something plus four times something plus six times something plus four times something plus one times something. It's going to be five terms, guaranteed, because I see five numbers here. So all I have to do now is to figure out what the heck is here. There's also a pattern to that. And if you can master this pattern, you are already well prepared for our problem set. Please take a look. This is very, very important. What I like you to do is, I'm going to clear this so you can see it. What I'm going to ask you to do, uh, yes, what I'm going to ask you to do is consider our problem set that I just released to you. If you look at number four in my problem set, I'm going to ask you to do binomial expansion. So it is in your best interest to pay attention. And after today, you can probably just finish this question off. So all you have to do is work on these three pattern questions. All right, here we go. Um, shoot, I totally just lost our original. Where is it? Binomial theorem. All right, here we go. Here's how we do it. Everyone ready? I'm going to go ahead and, oh no, it's cleared and I can't get it back. All right, I'm going to take the expanded form of 3 because I remember it. I'm going to simplify this here. This used to be 1 x to the power of 3, 3 x squared y, 3 x y squared, and 1 y cubed. I'm going to use the pattern and tell you that this is going to be x to the power of 4, 4, 6, 4, and 1. And let me remind you that I am not a genius. I didn't memorize this. I don't have photographic memory. I just simply used a pattern and spit this out that quickly. And I'd like you to recognize this pattern too. And by the end of today, I hope you, you have this. And if you take data management, that you'll just take this with you. We already established that the coefficients match the numbers in Pascal's triangle corresponding to the n value, which is also the exponent value. Everyone's okay with that. Someone other than Josh, say yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Next, what I'd like you to recognize now, or notice now, is the exponents for the x. The x is the first variable. 3, x to the power of 2, x to the power of 1, x to the power of 0, so it's not there. What's happening to the exponent for x? Decreasing. Not you, Josh. Someone else. 
It's getting smaller. Yes, it's getting smaller by one every single time. Take a look at this one. This is to the power of four, right? So x starts with the power of four, and then it's three, and then it's two, and then it's one, and then it's zero. What's the pattern? You see it? N minus one? Not even N minus one, just, just subtracting by one every time. So it starts with the four, three, two, one, until it disappears. Next, I'll use, uh, uh, I'll use green. Look at these numbers. Why? Why? There's nothing there. So it's basically to the power of zero, and then one, and then two, and then three. And then four, what's happening to the exponents for y? It's increasing. It's increasing. So for the y exponent, we start at zero and we end with whatever the exponent is. That's how I got this so quickly. If you gave me an exponent of five, you gave me an exponent of six, it gave me an exponent of anything, I can spit out the numbers in literally 30 seconds, the entire thing. I can multiply this out in 30 seconds, no problem. And that is another beautiful pattern from Pascal's triangle. So we're going to try it. I'm going to ask you to take out a piece of paper. Uh, you might be copying this down, so I'll wait on you. For those of you who are faster with writing and have copied this down, I want you to try number one below. Okay, expand x plus y to the power of 6. I want you to do that in like, in seconds, if possible. Okay, take it slow, actually. Uh, I will show you how you can do it first. And then once you get the hang of it, your the speed will pick up. Okay. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe it's better that I demonstrate it and then you can make notes on it. I'm going to come back to this, so don't worry. Sharing. The question says x plus y to the power of 6. Okay, This is binomial expansion. So if anything, I, could, I bet I could have started today's lesson just right here. This is it. If you have a piece of paper, I hope, go to Pascal's triangle and tell me what my 7 coefficients should be. Someone other than Josh and Kennedy, tell me what my seven coefficients are going to be by looking at Pascal's triangle. Come on now. I can't just have I can't just be teaching two people in this class. What are my coefficients? At one six, perfect. So one something, six something, fifteen something, twenty something, another fifteen something, six something, and one something. Once you have that down, beside every coefficient, I would you I would like you to write two brackets two brackets, two brackets, two brackets, two brackets, and two brackets. Each of these brackets are going to hold your two terms in the binomial. So x, sorry, I'll write that in black. That would be x, x here. x, x here, x, x, x there, and x there, y, 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 and y. Note that if that's a negative, then it would be negative y, negative y, negative y. Anyways, next, consider 
uh, exponent is a six. If you can count down, then you're good. From the x value, start with the number six and write one number lower for every um, sequential x value or x variable. And then, just like we did, start from zero for the y value and start increasing by one. And that's it. All you have to do now is simplify. So this is one, six to the power, uh, x to the power of six, y to the power of zero is nothing, so this is just x to the power of six plus six times x to the power of 5 and y, 6, x, 5, y, 15, x to the power of 4, y squared, plus 20, x to the power of 3, y to the power of 3, plus 15, x to the power of 2, y to the power of 4, and 6, x to the power of 1, y to the power of 5, and 1, which I'm not going to write, x to the power of 0, I don't need to write, it's just y to the power of 6. If you know Pascal's triangle and you know this pattern, you will never have to do distributive property ever again. For binomials, of course. So again, I'm hoping I'm making it sort of easier to digest. Okay. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. Okay. And then use a different color. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Yeah. We can do this. Okay. We can do this. Any questions? I'm guessing there's probably not going to be questions. It's more just, can we see it again? Um, I'm going to do it one more time. If you take a look at our handout, you'll see that I ask you to try a ridiculously silly question at the very bottom. All of these questions I think you should be able to do. But just for fun, for me, uh, just to be annoying, I gave you a, a very difficult question. I think I'm going to do it with you because it has a fraction and your um, your problem set has a fraction. I'm not going to do 14 though. If you look at my answer key, I do like the first four terms and I say, hey, if you got the first four terms and you know the pattern, don't worry about it. How about I do 3b squared minus 2 over b to the power of do an easy number. Someone give me an easy number other than Josh, Kennedy, or Anna. Just Give me an easier number that I can do as an exponent. I don't think I want to do 14. 6. Right on. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the whiteboard. Let's pretend I have 3b squared minus 2 over b, and that is to the power of 6. Using Pascal's triangle, I know that the sixth row will be 1, 6, 15, 20... 15, 6, and 1. So here we go. 1, bracket, bracket, plus 6, bracket, bracket, plus 15, bracket, bracket, plus 20, bracket, bracket, plus 15, bracket, bracket, plus 6, bracket, bracket, plus one, bracket, bracket. I'm going to give about 30 seconds for you to catch up.
a next. Um, 3b squared, 3b squared, 3b squared, 3b squared, 3b squared, 3b squared, and 3b squared. Next, negative 2 over b, 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 and negative 2 over b. Next, starting with 3b squared, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And then, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. All that's left is for you to simplify, which, yes, is a little annoying, excuse me, but still doable. Shall we? Yes, yes we shall. Let's do it. 3 to the power of 6, so I'm going to just purely do the coefficients here, okay? That is 1 times 3 is to the power of 6, and then the negative 2 is right now to the power of 0, so that's just 3 to the power of 6. That is something I need the calculator for. 300, uh, 729. Next, let's do the variable. b squared is to the power of 6, and then 1 over b is to the power of 0. So that's basically, this is the 1, and that's b 2 times 6. That's a b to the power of 12. Please remember your exponent laws. When you have a power of a power, the two exponents, the, the powers themselves, multiply. Next. Once again, let's do the coefficients. We've got 6, 3 to the power of 6, and negative 2 to the power of 1. So 6 times 3 to the power, oh sorry, that's a 5, that's a 5. 3 to the power of 5 times a negative 2 to the power of 1. That is negative 2,916. And then, let's do the variable. That is b squared. That is to the power of 5. And 1 over b is to the power of 1. So this is b to the power of 10 divided by b. The variable is b to the power of 9. Oh, someone might be writing that, so I'll just leave it here for now. Okay. Let's use green. So the next one, 15, 3 to the power of 4, and negative 2 to the power of 2. So I'm going to assume that's going to be a positive value because a negative, ex, uh, a negative base is being squared. So 15 times 3 to the power of 4 times negative 2 to the power of 2 is... Four thousand positive four thousand eight hundred and sixty. Next, let's do the uh, the variables. B squared is to the power of four, and one over B is to the power of two. That is B to the power of eight divided by B squared. B to the power of six. Now I'm using red. 20. 3 to the power of 3. Negative 2 to the power of 3. So 20 times 3 to the power of 3 times negative 2 to the power of 3 is going to be a negative value. 20 times 3 to the power of 3 times negative. Negative 4,320. Let's do the variables. b squared is to the power of 3, and 1 over b is to the power of 3. That is b to the power of 6 divided by b to the power of 3. The variable is going to be b to the power of 3.
Three more. We can do this. Three more. I will use blue. Fifteen. Three to the power of two. Negative two to the power of four. We've got fifteen times three to the power of two times negative two to the power of four. That's fifteen times a nine times two four eight sixteen. Positive. 2, 1, 6, 0. Notice how it's positive, negative, positive, negative, and back to positive. Next, uh, b squared is to the power of 2. 1 over b is to the power of 4. That is b to the power of 4 divided by b to the power of 4. That's just nothing. It's just 1. So I don't have to write that. Next. What colors do I have left? I guess I could use orange. 6, 3 to the power of 1, negative 2 to the power of 5. So 6 times 3 to the power of 1 times negative 2 to the power of 5. 6 times 3 times a negative. That is negative 576. Now, b squared divided by b to the power of 5, divided by b3. Um, how about maroon? Last one. 1 times... 3 to the power of, oh, anything to the power of 0 is just 1, so I don't have to worry about that. It's just negative 2 to the power of 6. Negative 2 to the power of 6 is positive 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. And then anything to the power of 0 again is 1, so this divided by b to the power of 6. There it is. It took a while, but guaranteed that's going to be a lot faster and if you were to actually expand this out yourself. This is what I'd say is the power of binomial expansion. As long as you know Pascal's triangle and how to apply the exponents from you know n to 0 and then 0 back to n, you can expand just about everything. I mean, we're recording this, so you can use this as a reference to solve your problem set question 4 as well. But get some practice in. Try working out these questions that I have as homework, and you can compare your answers with my answer key that's already up on Google Classroom. Does anyone have any questions? Again, I have a feeling that the question is not really there. It's just a matter of, let me try it first, and then I might have some confusions later. Uh, a word of caution. When you do binomial expansion, you need to be careful of when there is a negative because that will cause your um, cause your signs to flip between negative and positive and negative and positive and negative and positive. Okay, and also if you do happen to have the same variable, then they can cancel out. That's a twelve, and then it cancels out, became a nine, it became an even, an odd number, even and odd. They could start to cancel out. Okay, so just be careful of those. It's going to be your, I guess, your final opportunity to clarify anything before uh, I let you try things on your own. A quick reminder, if there's nothing else. Yes, there is a problem set for chapters 1.1 to uh, 6.1 to 6.3, but your priority is to do the quest. Okay, last call is this Friday at midnight. Okay, you have to get it done by that time. Otherwise, you'll end up getting a zero, which is not good. You have still lots of time to do it, but if you're still studying, you might want to quickly wrap up your studies and give the quest a chance. Okay. Um, what other things are... Wait, Mr. Kim? Yes. It's 11.59 a.m. or p.m.? Oh, p.m. 
sorry. Oh, midnight, midnight. midnight. Yeah. Um, what else is there? Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, assignments that I assign, but most people have gotten all the chapter four and five stuff done, which is amazing. Thank you. I am still in the midst of marking all of them, but I can't give back the marks until everyone is given a fair chance to submit it online. And I did post that I would let you hand it in by this coming Monday or it's a zero. I want to put a hard cut off because we only have a, like two weeks and a half, about three weeks left before this quad is done. So I'm going to push you a little bit. Um, yeah, quest first, problem set next. Uh, please get some practice in for uh, binomial expansion because we're not going to come back to this really. After 6.3, so starting from 6.4, we are finally looking at formal ways to describe patterns in sequences. And that will directly transfer onto our financial unit. So 6.4, in my opinion, is sort of like, you know, the final, you know, you're, you're finally venturing off into the great unknown. Chapters 6.1 up to now is just sort of intro and playing with patterns and having a little bit of fun doing some puzzles. Okay, so 6.4 is the real stuff that will build the foundation for the money stuff. Uh, I think we only have three more in class. Yeah, so basically three weeks plus a little bit for certain people, right? It's, it's pretty scary. Um, yeah, you only see my ugly mug for three more classes. Yay. If there aren't any other questions, uh, we can dismiss a little early today. Um, please get the problem set uh, done, especially since... Pascal's triangle is sort of fresh in your mind. Maybe you can use question four as part of your homework and just get that out of the way and have it reserved somewhere. Uh, once that's done, take a breather and then get back to finishing off your quest and any other assignments you might not have gotten done yet. You are officially dismissed. I will stick around for any questions you might have. Have a good day. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow at two o'clock. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. No problem. Bye, thank See you, you later. Bye.